All right. Hey, buddy. Hey, how's it sound? Sounds great. How do I sound? Oh, you sound, sound good. Oh, thank you. Sound like you're an at no. <laughs> yeah, I am. Sometimes I have to troll even you. Well, hey, everybody. Auburn, Alabama. That's that's where uh, my my economics theory is sort of based. We'll say it's the Mises.org. If anybody's interested, lots of free material, free books, free audio books, free videos, free free everything, free. Where's the baby? There wife? is no free lunch. We all know that, but it is free to you. So. Of course, I can't say there's no free lunch because we haven't empirically proved that, I suppose, right? Yes, we have. I think Milton Friedman did a very good empirical set of research on the free lunch, but, you know. All right, so let's have this debate that economics is a science. So, yes, yeah, so, so first let's say what do we mean, like what is the disagreement here? So economics is a science. Yeah. Like what what exactly are we disagreeing? So science, a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. Um, I'm saying simply that it's not it's not purely empirical science. It's not economics is not the application of mathematics as some people seem to employ it as. I, I say it's more it is a social science as virtually everybody defines it as social science, a major category of academic disciplines concerned with society and the relationships among individuals within a society. It in turn has many branches, each of which is considered a social science. Social sciences include economics, political science, dot, 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 dot. Yes. So, I mean, economics is really listed. It's listed under social science in every single college out there. It's listed as a social science by even by most economists, I think it's yes. okay. it's never considered natural. And you know, I, I would say I actually think economics is, in a way, a natural science in terms of a lot of the laws are aspects of natural law. In fact, that's what I'm going to be doing quite a bit of research into, hopefully over the next year for my dissertation. But that's another story. Right. So buy my book when I'm done. No. <laughs> <laughs> buy his book. Buy my book when you're done. Uh, it'll be coming out in about eight years when I finally crack the ability to match Jungian psychology with behavioral economics. Let's see how that goes. So you know, I mean, I I'll just preface this. What got me into economics is I was a math major, and growing up, my you know my dad was all the he was always pretty much pol political, sort of, we'll say. And so the marriage of the two into economics really got me interested in the field. It's just that as I, be as I began to learn more about it, kind of outside college, I began to be more interested in the social theory of it, the, the idea of think like an economist. And I'll get into that later. But And the idea that math really doesn't have a significant role in economics and that's that's what i'm going that's what i would argue okay so now if you go to your wikipedia page that you just quoted social science from you'll see the next paragraph right positivist social scientists use methods resembling those of natural science as tools for understanding society and so define science in its stricter modern sense interpretivist social scientists by contrast may use social critique or symbolic interpretation rather than constructing empirical falsifiable theories. So when I state economics is a science, I am using the positivist statement because I come from the School of Chicago and neoclassical economics, which state that econ is a science, a logically positivist science. Now, when it comes to mathematics, here's what economists do with mathematics, because this gets really weird, right? So we can map how gravity works with force equals mass times acceleration and those three laws, and we can understand how gravity plays on uh, different bodies of mass and things of that nature, right? But we take that exact same equation, right, the exact same equation for, uh, for gravity, and we can actually apply it to international trade. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. So 
we take the mass of an object, which is the size of the GDP of the country, and we and we show the size of another country's GDP, we will actually see the trade being exactly the same as what we would find in You won't, but you won't. But you because there's much more there's much more than math to okay. international trade. But no, hold on, hold on. What I'm saying is is that we can use that equation to map the amount of trade between the two. So the United States has this giant GDP. It, it, it brings in trade at an equal amount to uh, its mass compared to the other mass that we would use in the uh, gravity equation. Secondly, DNG modeling, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium modeling. What is, what is the importance of it? Now, do not get me wrong, it's not something that we get an absolute answer from, but what it does is, is we can set something in general equilibrium and we can basically poke it. So that's what you're doing. You're like poking it off of equilibrium and you're watching it react. Now, based on how it reacts, we can understand how it will react in real life. And then we take that and then we empirically test it. So we have our assumptions, we get our assumptions from our mathematics and from our modeling, and then we test those empirically. That is why we use math and economics. And, it, and it's also as simple as like utility equations. Um, uh, okay, uh, utility equations, these are somewhat useful to economists who want to study it give it, and they want to apply numbers, but the reality is you, utility doesn't really make a lot of real world sense because you cannot apply a number in the method that it is to the idea of satisfaction, right? Pleasure, satisfaction you get from an object. How many utils do you get from what are you getting from watching TV right now? All I can say is that you're you're getting more utils from, I guess, watching TV than doing the debate or something, right? You're getting more than you would be from getting dinner because you're doing it. That's all we can really say is that people, people, so let me say, Austrian economics is based on axioms. So, I mean, assumptions is what you're saying. You're based on math assumptions. But the Austrian school is based on a series of assumptions or axioms, which are laws of how people behave. That is, people behave purposefully. And, you know, Mises says that people behave purposefully with goals and action. their actions are based on certain goals that they desire to achieve. People are rational. People act in the way in which they believe will get them to that goal. So uh, we could do, we could talk about it. Aristotelians, the good, things like that, which are economic principles really, because that's what people are trying to achieve. And so if we say people achieve people seek to achieve a certain end goal, they will they will uh, base their actions on what they believe will get them to that end goal. And then we can go from there. We can start to develop, use logic and reason and figure out, okay, what's, uh, why would they do this? And what, you know, basically Austrian economics is an explanation of how things are, how things work. And you can use Austrian economics knowing if you know how things work and how people behave and how markets work, then you can, you know, it's not an application, but I see no reason that you couldn't apply your knowledge of things, how they work to how things ought to be as well. You can use positive economics to use, right? To uh, to go into normative economics, right? Well, well we would typically use positive positivism and uh, empiricism for policy decisions, which is why the Chicago School still retains the most um, Nobel prizes. So they're not really the best at coming up with theoretical models, though they do. Uh, what they do is, is they test and they empiricize models of other schools. Um, now, when, it, when, when we talk about rational actions, I'm, I'm actually against that idea. I don't think people tend to act rationally a lot. Um, well, this is, a, this is kind of the way we say rational. People are emotional. Yeah, people act with emotion. But we're saying rational. We're saying people do not intentionally seek to harm themselves, right? You would agree with that. Uh, to some extent, I do, but that's not, I mean, I, I'm not going to quote Milton Friedman here when we talk about the rational. So Milton Friedman says, well, 
here in economics, we study the rational, and you know, a lot, there's a lot of ideas based on where you land in the school of economics, right? If you're a New Keynesian, there's very good reason that you would assume that Frederick Hayek was a bigger uh, influence on Milton Friedman than the reverse, right? So Hayekian's Austrianism kind of led Milton Friedman to his rationalism and things of that nature, but he would get that through, through, through positivism, anyway, because they worked together a lot at Chicago. Um, anyway, I digress. So Milton Friedman says we need to understand the the ninety percent of people who are rational because we don't care about the ten percent of irrational people because they're irrational and there's no way to really set a market for them to understand what they're going to do. So I, I wouldn't put rationality as something that's uh, that's just so simple as like they're just not trying to harm themselves because many people's actions do harm themselves. They may not be trying to. They may be thinking they're rational, but they're most likely not. I mean, we can we can test this through game theory. We can test this through uh, through asymmetric games, right? So if we have asymmetric uh, information from one to the other, then that person can't make a rational decision, and that's a that's a big fundamental miss for the Austrian school is asymmetric well, no, no, information. No. I, I, well, no, because we're saying that when people act, they take the information they have and they make a decision on what they believe to be the best, right? So I would say if somebody's interested in economics, there's a book, Homer Economicus. There's also yada, 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 econ.com, which are economics of Seinfeld. And these are great ways to introduce people to economic ideas. But Simpsons, there was a episode of the, um, the Mc, it was a McRib of some sort. And it was, you know, the animal that they made it of went extinct and they had one left. And a guy trades his Corvette for the McRib and then he has... He has buyer's remorse at the end, right? We get buyer's remorse in everything. So it doesn't mean that when you made the action, you were not thinking rationally. You were just were not using all the available information. You were just using a certain amount of information that you believed was available to you. So, <clears throat> so well, what we're saying is people, people act in what they believe to be their best intent, right? People, people take selfies and fall off cliffs. And you look at that and you're like, what an idiot. I can't believe he did. Did he do it on purpose? Did he mean to, to fall off the cliff? No. It's just he didn't really think through his entire action, right? We could say he acted rationally in that he believed this was the best thing for him. Now, we can look at that and say, well, clearly it's not. But, you know, people bought houses the day before the crash, right? People, uh, people bought Lehman Brothers the day before it crashed and went bankrupt. So were those rational behaviors? Um, no. Yes, but they were. They were just. They they had buyer's remorse, though, right? Yeah, we could say that. Um. So I mean, I, let's, I know let's, things. Let's, move on to another, let's not get bogged down with another topic. So let's uh, let's try to jump back to to this as a science. So. What you're stating is that it's a social science, and you were taking the um, you were taking well, the interpretive social scientist stance um, that we we may use social critique or symbolic interpretation rather than constructing falsifiable theories. I'm stating as a positivist that social scientists use methods to simply know those of the natural sciences as tools for understanding society, and so define science in a stricter modern sense. Um, so uh, uh, let's go back. Let's 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 go back to empiricism and, and, and actually testing data, right? So Austrians really don't have a good way to test data. They have no strong methodology for, let's say, monetary theory, right? Um, and we'd had this discussion earlier about inflation. Right? So the yeah, we'll debate that later. We'll we'll debate that again. Um, well, 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 I, this, I, this is leading that. so. What, what yeah, I'm just saying say is that inflation leads to the Austrian business cycle, correct? Not necessarily, not, not in that simple a form, no. It's the idea of interest rates, low interest rates drive people to borrow more money. Low interest rates also drive infl do drive inflation because they mean the, the Fed is going to print a lot more money. To get the money out there to get the interest and get the interest rates low, but it's the idea of low interest rates drive 
it's a good incentive to go out and borrow money and invest. But as interest rates go up, we saw what happens. 2005, they start to go up. People start to to get underwater on their loans and they default and you get into the, the burst of the bubble. Okay. So it's an interest rate based business cycle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the reason why I say that is because there's no way in Austrian economics to empirically prove that that statement is correct. Now, me as a neoclassical, I, I'm not just a neoclassical. When it comes to monetary theory, I'm a market monetarist. So what we have said, and it's something that Milton Friedman said, that interest rates are a bad way to judge monetary policy. And this is empirically stated within his book with Schwartz. And uh, it's also been empirically proven through Scott Sumner's uh, The Midas Touch, his paper. So what they state is, is that, let's say that the Austrian statement that low interest rates cause higher levels of inflation, or at least incentivize people to borrow more. Well, empirically, the actual opposite of that is true. Higher no, because we say law of demand, right? Are you denying the law of demand? I can give you at least two arguments against the law of demand. Giffen goods and uh, interest rate policies. Giffen goods. You're saying that low interest rates, people will borrow less. They tend to, yes. And in but they don't. They rate, tend to borrow more. No, in high interest I can prove rate, it with the housing market. You cannot prove it. See, this is my the point. housing market. You have no empiricism in Austrian economics. Sure, you do. It. No, you don't. What? What? What, what is the housing market? It? How do you prove it? What is the housing market? Interest rates went down. People borrowed a lot of money. That's conjecture at this point. Well, no, it's it's actually been shown. It's Bumblebee. The in two thousand. Was it? So yeah, the, how did how did it go? So uh, you know what? I'll post a graph of interest rates because I have it somewhere. But you saw the interest rates were uh, went up, uh, caused the the dot bubble, dot com bubble crashed in '99. Interest rates dropped. Uh, thanks to Krugman and his likes, they demanded a low interest rate. They tr he tried to or he said he wanted a housing bubble. So they dropped interest rates. They got the housing bubbles. Interest rates started to go up. People started to borrow less. Right? So they borrowed more because interest rates were low. I mean, this is just common sense, really. Well, when I tell you, the in, what is an interest rate? Interest rate re reflects basically the cost of money, right? The time difference of money. When it's low, that means borrowing money costs less. So I will borrow more. As the price of money goes up, I decide to borrow less, right? If I have a 4% rate of return expectation and interest rates are 2%, I tell you, you know, that's a pretty good deal. If interest rates go up to 6%, I'm not going to you know, guarantee that I lose money. So I'm going to not borrow interest rates. So there you go. So it's, I think that's a pretty good, right. basically empirical approach. That's not an empirical approach, though. That's conjecture. You're saying that there is correlation between the two. But one, you don't have any, again. We got I'm saying the housing data from 2000s. Right, but that doesn't prove your point. That's, that's correlation. That doesn't, that doesn't give you causation. See, this is my point about Austrian economics not having any empiricism. Can you prove that? Can you prove that Austrian economics doesn't have any empiricism? Go out, find me data, and prove that statement. Um, how about this? Uh, no, you just Austria, said that you said you're trying to make me prove something with data, then prove your own statement with data. Not every statement can be proved with data, right? No, but I don't. I, you, you're missing the point here. You're, you're missing the point that I'm trying to drive home. In Austrian economics, and in in the interpretivist uh, social science mode, which is very similar to social psychology and sociology, they do not have a set way for empirical evidence. I'm a positivist. Everything that I have to state has to be falsifiable. You do not have that burden. Can you falsify that statement? What, the, the statement about me that, being a positive? About falsify, falsibility, that every statement to be true must be falsifiable? Is that what you're saying? That's not what I'm saying. I'm a pragmatic when it comes to truth. This is not the same. I'm saying empiricism and positivism, right? So... If I make a statement in econ, right, so I say that interest rates 
as they go higher, people tend to borrow more. It is on me as the person makes that statement. I have the burden to prove that correct. But my I don't need to prove it. To I prove need to provide wrong. evidence. My job is to prove that wrong. You can't prove anything, any of this. You can't prove it. You can provide ev significant evidence and show that it's true. Right? So if, if, if I have a correlation level at above 80%, I, there's, there's no reason, there's no statement of proof there. No, you're not proving it. You're just saying that it's highly probable. When does something become proven? You state the law of demand and the law of... Supply. No, I'm just saying that the, the absolute... Because if, if I can show you a counterexample, have I just completely disproven you? Yes. That's 20% of the time, I disprove you then. twenty. You said 20% of the time, you're disproven. So you that invalidates that's not, your statement. That's not what correlation levels tell you. You know that. Economic, you just said 80%. That means right, 20, right. But well, it's a correlation level. That means there's 20% that's not within the realm of my parameters. That doesn't mean that 20% proves me wrong. It's just like, based on my parameters, there's 20% that I don't know. That's what your blue... Well, I'll give you an example. So Planet Money did a... US and Planet Money, I think, right? Correct? what you listen to planet money right haven't you said that before npr's planet money it's a economics business podcast it's a great podcast they did a study study and that's where some guy read about an esp study and where the the study proved that esp works now we would probably i think most of us would laugh at that and so did this other guy so he created a little foundation type thing and he studied 100 proven studies and he was unable to to replicate 47 of them Right. So the idea that we can prove something at a 95 percent level, you, you can't actually prove anything. That's why in statistics. So we all say prove. I know. I know we don't actually mean prove 100 percent, but we say in statistics, if I can show something is true, I say it is statistically significant at the statistically significant level. Or just, uh, what's the exact wording? It's been a while. Uh, I, sh I have st statistically significant evidence to show that my statement is true. Right. Yeah, but it might not be true, right? Right, but that, that goes back to the okay. positive. That's if you're a positivist, you take that stance because every statement that you make is falsifiable, right? That's positive versus normative economics. I I I, I can make normative statements, but in, in the in the in the science, it has to be a positive claim, right? It has to be a falsifiable claim. I can't just say something like we ought, because you know that's not that's not a positive statement. But that's what this whole argument is about, is we ought. No, so. this argument's about science. That, well, no, that it's about, it's about whether or not we ought to economics. believe. It's like we ought to believe the Austrian or the neoclassicalist. Um, no, this is a statement of, I guess I guess if I wanted to take it down the route of truth, I guess we could, we could have the argument of pragmatism versus I don't even know what you're... Well, let me say, I so I I grabbed some when you when we were arguing. I was in the gym, so I rushed home, um, and I grabbed scribbled some things. I had actually for, from the paper that I want to write. All right. So Mises is considered economics as an a priori science. That is, it is basically it's based on reason and logic. That's where we get the ideas from. Economics is not scientism, which uh, Hayek used to kind of laugh at the classicalists, the scientific you, <laughs> uh, rather than the laws of economics are within you and can be dredged out through reason and logic is kind of what I think he was saying. The idea of think like an economist doesn't mean go out and study the world and grab data. Rather, it means before you're making choices, do cost benefit analysis, use opportunity costs, basic economic, fundamental economic ideas that we have. I mean, I go in Mancuse. So I, I looked at Mantu. What's the definition of economics? The study of how society manages manages its scarce resources, not the study of how society goes out and empirically views how resources are produced or something like that. Right, he's got his 10 principles of economics. People face trade-offs. The cost of something is what you get when you give it up. Rational people think at the margin. People respond to incentives. Trade can make everyone better off. Markets are usually a good way to organize uh, governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. I, just, I don't agree with some of these, but you know, none of them are go out and study the world. They're just basic 
economic principles by which we can study things, right? So why I think math is problematic, and I get this from Walter Block and one of the things he talked about, and I, I think it's actually a good good idea. When I teach economics, I don't really use much math because it's just an, it's an intro course. And again, I think economics is much more interesting, fun. It's something that people will actually go out and, and try to absorb if it's not a just a, another calculus class or something. So one of the problems with math as with economics as a mathematical science, purely empirical, is that um, well, one, econometrics proves, faulty science of econometrics proves anything you want. I've, we've gotten into that before, Freakonomics and their abortion study uh, and the study I just mentioned. It also disincentivizes very bright individuals who don't like math but would like to study economics. And they come into an econ class and they find that calculus is at the basic level. They're going to say, oh, crap, not for me, right? So most economic human desires, pleasure, usefulness, incentive structures, laws of supply and demand. These are not mathematical models. And I think you, shoving math or shoving economics into the math science is problematic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a, a standard statement. So principled offshoot objections to mathematics and econometrics fail. Now, I'm not saying that, that there aren't uh, good reasons to not agree with mathematics and econometrics. Um, they're not immune to some weak criticism, to wit, they simply have not delivered the goods. When Mises wrote Human Action in 1949, economists used mathematics and econometrics were still in its infancy. This is now what, like 60 years later? The science of economics has made progress, but how much does it use to uh, math and econometrics? Okay, I'm gonna give you 10 New ideas that have came out since 1949. All right. Human capital theory, rational expectations, macroeconomics, the random walk view of financial markets, signaling models, public choice theory, natural rate models of unemployment, time consistency, the prisoner's dilemma, coordination games and hawk dove games, Ricardian equivalence argument for debt neutrality, and contestable markets. Formal mathematics was the main language used to present these ideas in academic journals, but was math instrumental in the discovery of these ideas, or did the journal articles merely take an interesting intuition and then work backwards to determine where mathematical assumption applied it? Out of the whole list, there are a few plausible cases where mathematics was more thought than more than an afterthought, maybe an idea, number two, possibly number three. Even there, intuition, not math, probably played the leading role. The contribution of uh, econometrics to economics are simply meager, uh, particularly because econometrics has crowded out traditional qualitative economic history. The popularity of econometrics has made it very difficult to do research in any period lacking data sets. All right, so a lot of this I'll agree with you, but here's the thing. We cannot simply reject- He agrees with me. There. Huh? Sorry, sorry. What did you say? <laughs> We, I said he agrees with me. Yeah, no, but here, we simply cannot reject it based on the arguments from Austrians because it's not sufficient. Because based on those 10 new ideas that I, I'm assuming even a good majority of, of Austrian economists agree with, like random walk to financial markets, um, I'm sure Austrians uh, agree with human capital theory. Um, rational expectations and macroeconomics. That's, that's actually kind of not far from the idea of, uh, of an axiom for you, you know, them. Uh, public choice theory, another one. Uh, natural rate models of unemployment. That's Milton Friedman right there, baby. So none of these are really outside of what Austrians believe. But the thing is, is empirically, Austrians cannot formulate or push these ideas in articles because they do not understand the mathematics and they do not do well enough and they're not sufficiently true to be used. Let me say oh. most Austrians have, uh, Austrians that are PhD Austrians have gotten their PhD from standard universities. They've done the math. They've done all the, the nonsense to get the PhD, which is mostly what PhD work is. It's just nonsense. Done it. Did two years of it. 
um, it's you know you'll forget it when you're done with it because it's not useful it's not applicable it doesn't matter so they've done all that so you saying that they don't understand the math they don't know how to do any of it they've done it how why would you say that they don't know any of it um, I actually reject that idea specifically because of George Mason University's Austrian economics concentration at the PhD level is meant for people who can't do math who go into econ and try to formulate these ideas. Who got a degree in that? Who of the major Austrians got a degree from George Mason in that specific field? Um, the big ones got it from NYU. Um, uh, one of the the one of the guys at Mises. Institute got it from Auburn. And I'm sure many of them have had struggled, like Rothbard struggled for years to get his PhD done. It took him 10 years, I think. Yeah, it was <laughs> awful. And if you read it, it was, it's, it's a slap in the face to everything that we know about economics. Well, I've already, I've already kind of debated on some of the things Rothbard simplifies, but with uh, we were talking about the, the abortion is not a libertarian viewpoint, right? So me and him agreed that Rothbard's argument on that is pretty ridiculous. You know, Mises has a, he has like a one paragraph where he disproves God. And I think it's, it's, you know, it was refuted by, by, by Augustine 2000 years ago almost. So, you know, there's, they come up with these ridiculous arguments, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that they're not bad in other areas. So, or good in other areas. Right. But I mean, here's the thing. I mean, Rothbard won his work in monetary, which is uh, he, what he's most famous for in Austrian circles, is, is probably the most absurd statement. I mean, we can look at the data from 1920 to now, and one, we can say the Austrian business cycle has not happened, right? So, again, we go back to your- You know, I, again, I would point to the skyscraper theory. <clears throat> right, and we've had this conversation, but there's no- yeah. So I won't describe it, but it does. Yeah. It's it's an application of the business cycle. Right, but there's 1925. Yeah. Everybody was in the roaring 20s. Times are great. It's wonderful, right? Incomes Hayek and Mises. They say, you know, something's wrong here. We don't we don't think this is right. They form an institute where they study business cycles. 1929, they're proven right. Um, 2005, 2006. You know, Austrians were saying, hey, this is this is the bubble. The bubble is where the problem is. You can listen to the rap, the Hayek versus Keynes rap, where it's the problem is in the bubble, right? The problem is in the good times. That's what causes the bad times. 2005, two, Peter Schiff is on TV saying, Stop. you know, it's the problem here. And he was laughed off the air. Still he was right. The air. He was right. No, he wasn't. Dude, a broken clock What happened clock in 2006, 2007? No, a broken clock is right twice a day, okay? How, how many 20 years straight did... Ron Paul screamed that there was going to be a house bust. It's not like it was just him. Volker said it. Green said it. Uh, ben Bernanke said it. It's not like he, Ben Bernanke was there. He said nothing was happened. He said there was no problem. No, that no, that's like not what he said. said. No problem that's whatsoever. Not what Bernanke said. said it would be very minor. It would be a soft landing. It would only only harm a very small percent of the market. Nothing to worry about here, right? You got a big explosion. Don't worry, people. Nothing to see. Right, but that, but the, but the housing market didn't create that. That's not what caused the bust. I mean, that's yeah, that's, it did. No, it did. The implosion of the housing market. It was yeah, the the implosion of the housing market was that that was the domino bust. that started everything. No, it's not. The recession started before the housing bust. Stop. The recession started. What recession? The recession never ended. The recession started in the '90s, and it never really ended. If that's who you're talking about, no. You're talking about the crash. No, because we 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 base recessions off employment rates and and liquidity, and neither of those were a problem in 2000 to 2000. Well, the definition of recession is GDP growth, right? Um, actually, two two quarters of negative GDP growth in consecutive. That's the typical definition of a recession. All right, so without pulling out the actual GDP data, which I think the recession began in 2007, 2008, that's the officially. Okay, so uh, a recession, a significant decline again, in economic activity spread across the economy lasting more than a few months, normally visible in real GDP, real income, employment, industrial production, and wholesale retail sales. 
It's not just a decline in GDP. There's other factors that go into what a recession is, which is why we can't really call what happened to Japan like this 20 year long recession because that would just be ridiculous. Um, no, they've got a 20 year depression. Right? <laughs> they have not been. You see but, what happened to Tokyo housing prices? Uh, now, again, that, that was banking, right? Banking caused that. But what caused it was, was it, it, uh, what it was no, they was the international banking rules. They the they raised the capital requirements from I think something like one and a half percent or something. And Japan had what six of the top ten biggest banks in the world, and now they have one. Are you talking about for them? Well, they have many problems. They have structural problems. It's not we can't just look at their monetary policy. Because if monetary policy was all it took to fix Japan, economics would have pulled them out of this weird. Well, he was on the cover. Of, yes, he was on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, Super Abe, Abe Nomics is here to save the day. It was just Keynesian bullshit. It was not Keynesian. Um, Abe Nomics is not. Keynesian. He was going to print lots of money and devalue their currency, and that was going to drive up their their GDP. No, he was not going to do that. That's simply false. He was not printing more money. He was setting up liquidity preference. He was setting up for uh, for boosting uh, the demand of money because they have a serious problem with nominal gross domestic product. The same thing that hit the uh, United States in mid-2007 and part of three early 2007. We started having a decline in nominal gross domestic product. That's what causes recessions, typically. Unless there's a structural problem the like in Japan, the banking systems. No, that's that's about preference for money. Um, if if people start holding on to money, then there's not as much money in the system. Why do people hold on to money? Why would people change their mind? It's worries about the future, changes in the in the incentive systems and in the economy, right. uh, uh, government uh, policy, uh, banking, inflation. I wouldn't say inflation's a, I wouldn't say inflation was the argument I would use, but yeah, sure, regulations change, one of them. Regulations change the way people hold money, but the point I'm driving home is that if you have a drop in nominal gross domestic product, you're gonna have a recession. Right? So nominal gross domestic product for people who don't know is all the money that's spent by an economy. Every penny that's spent is nominal gross domestic product. Now if you're part of the economy and you're withholding money from a bank and you're withholding spending money and you've got money stuck under your mattress, that money is pulled out of circulation, which lowers uh, the demand or actually raises the demand higher than the actual injection of money can go, which causes deflation. Now, deflation upsets an economy a lot because then you have falling prices. And then the exact everything that's true for inflation is true for deflation, except uh, it's much harder. Only it's only from the source of deflation. If deflation comes because of the monetary, the central bank restricting money supply, if it comes from a lack of money supply, then that, that can be problematic. Deflation in and of itself is not a problem. It's but not, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Uh, you like I like deflation. You like deflate. Everybody likes deflation. That is lowering prices, if you want to call it that. Well, that's what it is, and I, I do not like it. I, I like my prices rising because I like my income to rise along with my price. No, you don't. Okay. No, you don't. Okay. Real income rises when prices fall. You're on a computer right now. Real income falls. Why didn't you wait? Fall. Why, why did you? They're one and one. You can't have one. They're not the other. Yes, they are. Monetary it, okay, well, well, I don't want to debate that. We'll, so we only have five minutes. To say so. We'll debate that later. We'll debate inflation on a, a future topic. All right. So I'm going to give my final thoughts here. I think we've had a fun debate. Um, I definitely prefer these debates than like, especially after some some pretty controversial uh, uh, statements about some. In fact, I would have liked to have gone to Auburn myself, but everybody, this is I never, went to, I never went to Auburn, so so since he wants to show off his hat about how cool he is, this is my Omicron Delta Epsilon 
International Honor Society for Economics. I was going to wear my SDSU hat because I am a graduate of there, but I decided to wear the Mises hat. Oh, it's not really a Mises hat, but it's, you know, that's where Mises.org is based. So go ahead and give your statement, though. All right. Sorry. Uh, anyway, I really enjoy this, especially after the controversy of all the craziness and call-out tournaments. Um, and sometimes it is good to just have, like, open discussions rather than, like, legitimate debates where you're trying to be right. Um, that being said, uh, economics is a science. And the way I define science is, is, is different than what he said. And he wants to state it as a social science, which I'm not going to necessarily disagree with because I don't want to get into semantics. But what I'm saying is, is that he takes an interpretive stance and I take a positivist stance. I rely myself on, on an empiricism. My opponent relies on axioms and a priori. That is the fundamental difference here when we talk about econ as a science. When I say econ as a science, I state it is a logical, positivist, falsifiable statement to be made and that we can, through modeling and data, come up with something that is sufficiently true to be proven as a fact. That is why economics is a science and we can use those facts to, uh, to, to experiment with and to um, do future projections. Okay, so I'm saying that economics as a set of mathematical models and, and database is very problematic because you can use econometrics to say whatever you want. Um, it's just scientism, right? And uh, as you said, what'd you say, like, we're going to leave this to science or something? I think that's very problematic to say that we're just going to let science decide everything in our lives when we can just use reason and logic to decide to figure out a lot of things. The idea of economics is the term think like an economist doesn't mean go out and study the world and collect data before you make decisions and actions. It means you, you're in the grocery line. You want to think like an economist. You think which one, what item is going to give me the most pleasure for my money? Or you do a cost benefit analysis of whether you want to buy something or not. <clears throat> uh, I think the idea of, of going out and collecting data for all your decisions if that was think like an economist, it would be rather absurd. So it's not it's not a scientific in terms of that. Like that's what we're arguing about is is what does it really mean to be an economist? Does it mean to go out and study data? And I think to be an economist, it means to know how things work, how people behave, how society works, how people interact. And so that's that's the kind of science I'm the the social science that I'm interested in. And I think it helps to understand, uh, it helps, it would help the general population if they saw economics as that, as more of a social science rather than high level mathematics, which is what it tends to be taught as and really just drills the interest. And it, and it really destroys a lot of people's interest in the subject. Uh, I know of many people personally who have been drummed out of the, out of the economics. They might be very bright and very intelligent and have some great futures ahead of them, but because they get into a calculus three class and they, or a thing that really got me is the, um, the, uh, uh, what was that? The one class that I struggled with my math degree that I have a math degree. So, but it's the, it's the cross data analysis, all the things that they do in higher level math. But uh, I think think like an economist just means use basic economic axioms um, cost benefit analysis, things like that. So that's, I just think the, the Austrian economic theory is much more applicable to the real world and how people ought to behave. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyways, yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the debate. That was fun. So your high, your hardest high level math class was calc three. No, I did calc four. I did a uh, linear algebra. What I was saying, I did modern algebra. I did, 400 level everything so okay well i'm sure i'm sure if we had to actually delve down it'd probably be uh oh god what was that nastiness that i had to do i have to say linear that. algebra linear I algebra actually, and modern algebra are the worst i actually really like linear algebra there's nothing there's nothing in this world hard about a hessian matrix especially if you, if you take calc three and and linear algebra at the same time they're not 
too bad. They kind of go hand in hand. I, I can't do that. I like statistics, so that was the fun classes. Yeah. Statistics is my is my is my hard goal. Calc two is the hardest math I've ever had. So.